I first was looking for somebody who can talk about blockchain. But uh, as we discussed blockchain, um, he also started discussing his project. And, and then uh, a few other issues like ecosystem. And I thought that this is a great opportunity for us to actually have many things rolled in one. So here, Ilya. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. That's a huge honor. And uh, since innovation is uh, a path from point A to point B where you don't know where point B is, let's just check. Without knowing where it leads, let's check how, how prone you are to innovation. Innovation is doing without knowing, making mistakes. So without knowing, would you care to stand up right now from your, from your chairs? May I ask you to stand up? Just observe how you feel when you do this. You don't know where it leads. May I ask you to just jump? Just once. Be careful, it's just back. Another one. Yeah, we, we, talk, we will be talking about flying cars. So now you've experienced the flight. You will be knowing what we are talking to. Another thing, please. Ah, it was a joke. Good. Sit down. Thank you. You helped me to overcome my uh, fear of public speaking, but also you have made yourself healthy. Because what happened is that when you jump, do it in the morning, when you jump, neurophysiology uh, creates a hormonal impact on your body of growth hormones. So now we all are a little bit cured. That's, that's the cure. And that's also a little bit of pain killing and the end of things. We are a little bit happier now. So, um, Without further ado, um, uh, I will also do a little bit of innovation because I want to see the slides. I don't remember my presentation, I'm sorry. So I will do like this, and now we go. So that's the clicker. So we'll be talking about innovation, we'll be talking about the future, and one of the ideas about when, when we talk about the future is trying to embrace the vision where does it lead to? And uh, what once was uh, what, what what once was the future is actually now past. So uh, the Christmas Carol uh, tells us to embrace the spirit of the past. And uh, while uh, in our country that was the spirit of the past, in France, let's see. In France, Jean-Marc Coté was asked in the end of the 19th century to picture how France would be in a in hundred years' time. And there are a couple of pictures, and I'm, I want to test you uh, with the first, or rather buggy with these pictures, without even properly introducing myself, which I will do a little later. What do you see here? Does anyone recognize what this is? Do we have it already now? We have it. Yes, certainly. Now, what is this? Skype. That's definitely Skype. Um, but just just remember this picture because the, the question I will ask in the end will be, what's wrong with this picture? So, um, yeah, definitely it's Skype. Or video. What is this? <laughs> is there, huh? It is the microscope. Yeah, it is. So, um, it is the microscope, but it also it is the bacteria. Look at these things. They are scary. They scare shit. And, 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 and no, uh, the projector was scared. This is how it actually looks. For me, it looks actually even scary. So, let's see another slide. Now, this one will be difficult. Does anybody? Care to give it a try? Molecular kitchen. Okay. Any any, any more precise ideas? Ice cream. Artificial meat. I'll give you that. That's how it looks now. Come on. That's how it looks now. Any ideas? They are growing burgers. These are the meat for burgers. You have to grow in a, in, in a laboratory. So basically, uh, that's the flying uh, cars, that's the flying postman. And of course, we already have it now. 
and it looks like this. Uh, it's not our design though, but uh, basically the question I wanted to ask, what is wrong with the pictures? So who would care to answer? Mm, some pictures has, uh, have the uh, apparatus. I think it's uh, useful now, like postcard. Good. So technology, they thought, would require people to operate it. Good one. I actually never thought about this. Thank you. Uh, Ah, okay. Paper post, uh, independent flying poster. <laughs> that's actually that, that's what I wanted to elaborate on. But thanks for that, that one. Uh, anyone? Technologies uh, depicted are uncomfortable. They're um, messy. Comfortable, big and messy. Good. Well, they generally confuse the order, so they have a good idea of what will happen, but uh, in what they confuse in what order. Is Thank you for helping me during this lecture. I wanted to say that we, we notice big things. We have an idea of what we want. We notice big things that are happening now, like the cinema, like the uh, audio, this old style, what is called in English, gramophone, yes, and so. And we think of combining these big things, and we think that's the future. The truth is that we have to observe small things because a lot of things will change. The smallest of things. You wouldn't need wires for Skype. So no wires. You wouldn't need projectors because maybe it would be bad things. All the smallest of things, the materials, the shapes, the everything, is prone to change. So when you're picturing the future, I remember there was one comment here that somebody wanted to make on the stage to reduce doing their research projects and then not do mistakes in their startups. Forget it. Startup is the process of doing mistake after mistake after mistake because you never know the future. You can't. There are futures, the intersection of thousands of trends. So, with this pinch of salt, consider what I will be telling you also. What I will be telling you is not a huge few, uh, uh, hundred years from now, but it's like one year or two years from now. And it's happening already now, it's in the building, so we can plan it, not envision it. But, um, by the time you retire, it will be what's which year? 2015. Would you even know what the, what the world will be like in that year? So, um, my name is Ilya Kalikov, and I'd like to say that my personal data is carefully recorded and stored uh, on a website prohibited from the territory of the Russian Federation called LinkedIn. And um, I'm, uh, yeah, I have a long story of being a, a fintech. Uh, executive, um, then doing my own business, selling it to a large multinational, then completely switching the, the field that I went to do internet startups, did it for four years. Uh, out of 12 ideas, uh, 10 were complete mistakes. So we spent money and effort on that, we sold two. Uh, uh, more or less a moderate uh, modest exit so that uh, you can measure, but still some, some success there. And uh, now I'm the co-founder of a project called Martini, and as you may notice from this uh, Lamborghini, Lamborghini, or Lamborghini, as people say Ferrari, and this is Martini. But Martini is, a, is named after a talented aerodynamic engineer of the beginning of the uh, 20th century who fled from Mussolini to Soviet Union. So he wanted freedom, you know, in those days. So, uh, yeah, and we're building flying cars, we want freedom as well, who, who doesn't? So, um, yeah, he fled to Soviet Union, and he actually designed a lot of things in aerodynamics. We, he was a big teacher of Karolyov, Ilyushin, uh, Tupolev. He was, uh, he actually, when you fly Boeing and you observe those wings, those wings are calculated according to different equations that Martini, uh, Roberto Martini has, has designed, if you like, or, or discovered. Uh, so uh, he did for aerodynamics what Tesla did for electromagnetism, so we named the company after him. And uh, uh, if you, uh, 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 if, if I may also, um, Maxim Kiselev, one of your professors, is another co-founder of this project. And uh, uh, we're, um, uh, so, uh, and the project is about this car, uh, and uh, Nikolai, we will be talking about community and innovation, which is not happening without community. Nikolai is a leader of and, and founder of 
Creative Russia, a community of five, more than 5,000 designers, makers, urbanists. So uh, he, I, I took the courage of inviting him, uh, bringing, dragging him here. I uh, hope he will uh, help us to have a more fruitful discussion around this in the, uh, in the Q&A session. So we are building this car. Uh, so uh, just, just to give you an idea uh, uh, how how we sort of, where to insert the blockchain. I, I wanted to show you this picture. So this is a vertical takeoff and landing. Right now it's in cruise mode. So you can see that the engines are in vertical uh, position right now. Um, uh, so this is the hover mode. So you can see that the engines are uh, tilting, uh, uh, tilt shift engines and this is how it will land, and this is how it will look on your conventional parking lot. It's the size of the conventional business sedan, and it has eight engines uh, in four engine groups. It has chairs that will rotate so that you can easily sort of sit and then rotate into the into the uh, space inside. You, uh, we are we are the only Russian company that talks to Uber, and Uber. Uh, wants to deploy a network uh, or networks of uh, flying taxi systems in Dallas, Dubai, and Abu Dhabi in 2020. But even before that, if you come to, uh, to Dubai in 2019, you will most likely experience flying taxi by um, uh, another sort of car maker or uh, aerial vehicle maker or VTOLs as we call them, vertical takeoff and landing. So I will be using this VTOL just for uh, simplicity. So uh, another VTOL maker uh, called Volcopter, which, uh, uh, which has been making for, for the last five years. It's a, it's a helicopter with 18 small rotors on top of it. Um, and, and the prince uh, or sheikh of Dubai is already purchasing that to start the system. So, and in 2020, if you go to Dallas, you will just pop up your mobile app, you will choose Uber Elevate or Uber Air, it will come and pick you up, and hopefully it will be one of our cars as well. So, it's fuel electric, um, it uh, flies on one battery charge for 30 minutes, which, which is enough to do, on average, two hops within the city limits, or to go as far as 150 kilometers per one charge. Uh, so, um, yeah, uh, it, I have the technical specifications here, and the interesting thing is that, again, uh, innovation and risks and everything, we are, th this is the technology that is already available, so we're not inventing anything, we're, ta we're taking off the shelf things, the, uh, 15 aerospace engineers with, with more than 10 years experience in constructing, assembling, uh, test flying and certifying the big passenger jets, uh, they are making this uh, happen but of the technologies that are already available, the batteries, the, the hub, the, the, the materials. But we are betting very hardly, and that's, that's really the hope, the vision of it, is the high energy fuel cells. You see the small sprint. Sometimes it's important to look at a small script. With hydrogen fuel cells, it's an amazing technology. It allows to actually pack much more, uh, much more uh, energy into the uh, in, into the into the battery. It's no longer a battery, though. It's uh, I, I hear it. Just a second. Um, uh, it's a. Uh, hydrogen is a way to conserve electricity, if you like. So, if you if you take electricity, you put sort of two electrodes in, in water, and then uh, you have oxygen and hydrogen, as you may know. And you can sell oxygen or just breathe oxygen for the fun of it, and then take it, take the hydrogen and put it in your car. And this hydrogen is then electricity in, in a form where which you can transport. And around that will be a huge new world, as we think. This technology is expensive now, but we already now we have Toyota Mirai's, for example, are already on sale and have been for the past one and a half years. 
And uh, Toyota Mirai's, uh, there is a line, if you want to buy a Toyota Mirai, you will get one in five years. Uh, but uh, they are selling in, in, in the US, in California, in, in, in Japan, in, in Germany, in, in London. Hydrogen is very safe. Uh, in center of London, there is a hydrogen refuel station. No, uh, uh, no methane, no, no gas, no liquefied gas. Um, so what happens is that this technology, the bet we are making is that this technology will be more and more affordable. And it allows five times more range. So per one fuel of hydrogen, you will get to St. Petersburg which is uh, in, in less than two hours, or maybe three, yeah, three hours. So imagine the change this will bring to our lives. And imagine this being available in less than three years from now. So I had a question, but I, I would rather, actually I'll take this one, but I would rather use sort of uh, archive your questions to the end of the lecture, otherwise I can't manage my time. Yeah, so I assume that I <laughs> For China and they have already a prototype like that. So, is it a project have a prototype or is it just some, I don't know, some, uh, is, it, is it in development or is it complete? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, nothing yeah. is complete, that's for sure. I mean, we, we have, uh, there are 15 companies in the world that are talking to Uber and we are building something for them to choose from in 2022 years in, the, in their system. And, um, uh, all of the companies are more or less at the stage of prototyping, prototyping as we speak. Uh, Ehang, the Chinese uh, company, uh, they had a flying drone, and that's, that's an oversized drone that has the hover mode only. We have the cruise mode. This tilt shift actually allows a lot of energy savings because the body is the carrying wing itself. And uh, when you tilt shift the engines, you can go horizontally at much higher speeds than compared to if you only have your engines horizontally. And this uh, speed allows, uh, basically it speeds faster than 100 um, kilometers per hour, uh, the carrying force of the, of the body itself, which is which is a wing, um, basically uh, compensates the gravity, so you only have to drag it and you don't have to lift anymore. And that gives, uh, let's see if I have a laser beam here. Oh, that exactly gives uh, per one minute of hover, we spend five kilowatt hours energy. Per one minute of cruise, we spend on one and a half. And the, in, 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 this is basically the challenge, and we have demonstrated on our models that we can tilt shift and don't fall. And we don't fall. That's, that's the main thing, because you have to control different thrusts, different vectors of power. When you tilt shift, you suddenly lose a lot of, a lot of um, supporting, uh, um, um, how do you call it? Um, uh, um, very well said, thank you. you. You suddenly lose a lot of lift, so yeah, you, you, have to, uh, you, you have to adjust the motors, you have to have flight controllers that are capable of that. So that's, that's a challenge. So we have demonstrated we can do this. We, got them, we, uh, we demonstrated on, on different models that it does fly and the energy consumption is dramatically reduced and the speed dramatically increases and we are scaling it up as we, as we talk about right now. As everybody else at the moment, it is, with this type of design, uh, nobody's yet shown uh, the full functional ready-made commercial product. It's not, it's not in the world yet. But let's see. Let's go. Let's go on. Um, so um, now that's Martini. Why do we need blockchain? Some switch of topics. So um, um, does anybody has anybody heard the word <laughs> by show of hands? Everybody, I think, it's been in the news a lot. Um, so would anyone? think that blockchain for flying cars is a reasonable thing to do. Okay, <laughs> let me convince you otherwise. Good. Um, 
So uh, we can we could go into technical details of what is blockchain under the hood of it, but let's look at it from the user perspective. And from the user perspective, a ten-year-old can uh, download an app and have a financial account in less than five seconds. By the time he grows up, he goes to a bank, asks for a bank account, and the bank clerk says, okay, you come back in three working days, we'll have the account set up for you. And he says, well, what are you talking about? I already have the financial account where I could transact with anybody uh, in monetary terms or in, in terms of value, transferring value between, between us for different goods and services. Why do I need a bank account at all? The banks have realized that. And most of the banks are now looking very closely at blockchain. And they are trying to understand how to survive. Not how to use blockchain. But they are trying to understand how to survive when, when frankly speaking, they are not required anymore. Because what blockchain does, it is essentially a uh, non-breakable, non-corruptible uh, database of a growing, constantly growing database of transactions, uh, which is maintained by many people, by community, and that's why communities are so important, uh, maintained by many people, and that's why it's unbreakable, because if there is no one central server to break into. You have to break in into millions of computers. And uh, it's a constantly growing um, database of records. You may have heard the term distributed ledger, but let's not go into the terms, let's look at the substance of things. And all these records are actually transactions. So you can think that blockchain is a growing database of, uh, of records about people, or rather wallets, transacting between, between themselves, and they transact. So they, one is sending, the other is receiving, and they're sending is a piece of code. And that piece of code is in Bitcoin blockchain, for example, it's coin. And, and then this piece of code is a small piece of code that relates to, for example, uh, uh, to, to, to transfer of value. Just purely that, and only that. It's just transfer of value. But it could also be transfer of data. For example, it could be the transfer of your ownership right for a car, and that's what Volvo is currently doing. So in the future, when you go and buy a Volvo car, you will not be you will not have keys, you will not have registration documents, you will not you will prove your right of ownership because there is a record in some database which is not even located anywhere except for your own computers that, that are connected to this peer-to-peer -peer network. So uh, it's a, it's a, everybody remembers P2P, uh, everyone knows torrents, I would assume, uh, and, and, and you may look at blockchain as a huge torrent network where there is only one torrent, which is the blockchain. And then each block, what is called blockchain? It's a chain of blocks, and every block is, is a set of records. It's, it's just A transacted Z to B, and, and so on and so forth. That's just, just, just a ledger of records. And then in one block, uh, you can say that in Bitcoin, one block appears every like five to six, seven minutes. And then in this block, there is a number of transactions, and the block is signed, it's verified. It's in the system and it's there forever. Nobody can alter this record because there is, there is no way actually to alter that record. And it's always there unless all the millions of computers go bust. So, um, uh, so this transaction, um, it, when it is signed, when the block is signed, that's very important, there is a consensus mechanism. Remember those words, consensus or consensus protocol. Now, uh, you may have heard the uh, words proof of work, proof of stake, proof of something, and those are different consensus protocols or consensus mechanisms that are used 
so that all the millions of people that are part of the network agree that this is the correct record to put into the system. And um, this complicated uh, <laughs> a number of words uh, just means that uh, if you are an eligible uh, part of the network, you have your cryptographic keys to represent yourself. And that's the only way. You don't represent yourself by name or passport number or registration in Moscow City. You present yourself with your private key. And your private key stays private. It's, it's with you. It's always with you. You record it on paper. And there is your public key. And your public key is your num your Sometimes it is just your wallet number. Everybody sees your public key, but doesn't know that it is you. Um, so, uh, whenever uh, you present your private key to the system, the system knows, and you say, okay, I transact this amount of bitcoins to that wallet, and this is my private key to sign this transaction. So the system identifies you, every, the credentials are valid, and then the block, it's recorded in the block, and, um, to, and, and, and the cryptographic key has to be found to sign this block. And who finds this, and, and there's a lot of computational power that has to be put into finding, solving this mathematical puzzle. And by owning this power, by you basically make the network uh, secure uh, by, by, by requiring to have that much computing power. So when all the miners, and they're called miners, they're, they're not called miners because they mine bitcoins. Uh, they're, called, they're actually contributing, that's very, another word to remember. In this consensus mechanism, people contribute their computing power to maintain the network so that they demonstrate work they are doing with their computational power. And by that work, they vote. And by that voting, they, in a consensus mechanism, they validate that this set of transactions is actually correct. The hash of those transactions has been found if you Google it. And then they sign this block that contains all those transactions. The important things to remember here is that without community, Bitcoin is not, is not possible. It's, it's secure because there is a community, and a lot of work has to be done in order to have that thing secured. There is another consensus mechanism. Now, people are criticizing Bitcoin that it, the, all, the amount of energy that is used to maintain Bitcoin right now equals to all the consumption of energy by Ireland. So that's a little waste of resource, and people say that's a waste of resource. And we, we're living in a world where we don't want to waste resources. We collect plastics, we collect uh, you know, paper. And the thing is that there are other consensus mechanisms that make other networks, uh, there are other, other blockchains. Uh, one, for example, is proof of stake. So you vote by the amount of tokens you have on your wallet. So the more wallet you have, the more, the more invested you are in the system, the more voting power you have to validate that the transactions are correct, and you are motivated to act that transactions are correct, because then you get reward on top of your wallet holdings. Now, this may seem complicated, but from a user perspective, you either you are rewarded for maintaining blockchain. That's the, that's the huge change in, I would say this is the technology that is introducing huge change to society. Because you can have direct, measurable, honest, uh, verifiable reward for contributing your computing power, financial holdings, uh, maybe work, physical work that you do, and get reward automatically according to the rules set by the system. So there is no third party to decide how to remunerate you. So this, the third party is removed uh, in a transaction between two free men or women. And when the third party is removed, with that third party, removed are 
managers' salaries, uh, inefficiencies, transaction, transaction costs, but also removed are the, if you like, capitalistic appreciation, those dividends that the shareholders of the organization want to have for the fact that they have they are managing, they're, they sort of took the risks of funding this organization and its development. So a lot of things are removed. And uh, just to give you an idea of how large those things to be removed can be, uh, the market for flying cars is $100 billion. It's a lot. Uh, hundred billion dollars. That's, that's the right now there are twenty companies, so we can think that we're pretty well off if we, or when we deliver those cars. But the market for flights, the the, the amount of money that you will pay for your flights totals to one trillion dollars. So the cars, hundred billion. The flights, one trillion dollars. Now you ask yourself, where does the 900 billion go? Okay, it's the parking lot. I buy that. It's the certification. I buy that. It's also the energy that will be used. Okay, the energy will most likely come from solar powers, solar panels. There is some depreciation on that. Okay, I take that. But 900 billion, really? This 900 billion uh, will be taken by either centralized organizations that control the order taxi button, or there will be no 900 billion. There will be much less, because the infrastructure will be developed by guys like you, by contributing and getting reward, and like blockchain for Bitcoin, if a corporation would want to develop the computing power Consuming energy equal to the size of our, to the country size of Ireland, imagine how much the corporation would, uh, uh, would 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 charge, or how much it would have to invest to build such an infrastructure. Yet it appeared without any corporation, just by uh, efforts of the community, which or uh, which was united by one idea: let's tokenize money. Tokenization gives people the idea of owning part of the system and gives the, uh, not, not even the idea, but actually uh, gives them part of the system into their wallets and being rewarded for it. So Ethereum, for example, Ethereum tokenized computing power. So while Bitcoin blockchain is for tokenization of cash, of coins, of units of value, just for that, just to be able to exchange units of value. There are other blockchains for other uh, use. So Ethereum tokenized compu uh, computational power of the machine executing a code. So whenever you want to execute a code, you can put it onto Ethereum and pay different people who contributed their computing power to execute your code. And there are commissions, everything is supply and demand based, so everything is very fair. It's you pay according to the load. If the load on the system is low, your code will be executed faster and cheaper compared to when the load on the system is high, your code, same code, will be executed at a slightly higher fee. So what happens is that this gives and combined, and remember those pictures, let's combine the trend. You have something to, trans, to transact value with, and you have the code that can be executed. What does it give us? You have probably heard the term smart contracts. So you can actually make the system smarter than just allowing you to transact between each other in financial uh, elements, uh, units. You can make the system smarter, and you can actually do which other banks. You can give instructions. So, I pledge these tokens to be given to that guy if that guy delivers per that email certain thing that I need. And the code will automatically change 
so well, I'm, I'm a little bit generalizing here, it's a little bit more complicated, but the code will check the email, see that the thing is there, and disperse the funds. We don't need the bank clerk, highly paid, uh, MBA, uh, MSc in finance, 30 years of training to do that for us anymore. So, what next? Um, what next is uh, this idea of being rewarded for contributing your things into the system? What happens with those things? Now, who has heard the term Internet of Things? We have, we have all these sensors, we have things that are working for us. So, uh, somebody has bought this Epson uh, uh, projector. And it works for us. Maybe, maybe it doesn't now. What is the use of this projector? Okay, somebody might say, well, a thousand bucks was paid for it, so its value is a thousand bucks. But the value, consider it, the value is only there when you're using it. Why have you paid a thousand bucks? Now, who paid? Why did you do it? <laughs> no, that's probably not okay. Uh, the thing is that. Uh, in the modern world, let's, let's put another trend in the picture. Now, we have Uber. And Uber is the idea of being able to travel without owning a car. No longer you need, okay, it's, the taxis were there a long time ago, but never was it so that I press a button, no barriers to enter, and three minutes the car is here. Okay, take ride sharing, let's put one more further. Belka cars, all this, Delima B, etc. All these things. You don't need to own a car to own your right. You don't need the car to own the, uh, the function of, uh, of the right. You don't need to own, actually, it's actually also much cheaper because you utilize the resources much more intensely. Consider this projector here. If you buy a car, you only drive it 5% of the time. 5% of the time, average. A taxi driver in Uber utilizes the car uh, on average somewhere like 25% of the time. So it's five times better utilization. If everyone, and it's also, that's why it's cheaper for us. Uh, the total cost of ownership per kilometer of ride with old car is on average, depending on the car you have, but it's at least twice more expensive than, Uber, than driving with Uber. Why would you ever want to buy a car? Why? Well, you can say it's my personal space, I put my stuff in it, it's just there. I use it as storage in my house. So we need another function. But for a ride, you don't need to own a car anymore. Uh, you don't need to own a flat to have a shelter. There is the Airbnb. All this technology allows us to sort of access the function with one click, to own this function in one click. So you own if you are if you are, if you if you have a wallet on Bitcoin, you are already part of the huge international financial system. You can pay anywhere in the world. You can go. I'm not advocating for Bitcoin in particular, but I mean the, the functionality is there. You, you can't even get this functionality easily without blockchain and Bitcoin. Now consider, consider, back to the Internet of Things. So if you can have this function in at the top of the bottom, uh, what do you need to own things? You, you need to own the assets of what is it you have to own? Uh, uh, to, to have access to this function. Uh, okay, in Uber you download an app, you connect your, uh, your credit card to be able to use Uber. But uh, with this internet of things, if you start paying for all of the uh, useful function of the device, then we'll have fewer devices, better utilized, cheaper, available for everyone else, so the function of ride has already been reduced at least two times by, by the ride sharing uh, networks. The uh, um, uh, availability of shelter of living will be disrupted. I mean, it's, it's being disrupted right now. It's, the costs of living are reducing dramatically because of the 
people being able to share their flats when they're not used. So there's actually much more living space available already now for us. There is no less. So, and now the Internet of Things comes. With all the sensors, with all the computing power, you can really reward devices for serving us. Okay, robotics will come, and this idea will, will take even a huger, better, and a more precise loop. But consider that you can pay for a cup of coffee, uh, depending on the load of this coffee shop, depending on how much it costed to produce a cup, a particular cup that you're using, depending on where the coffee came from. And all that is recorded, and there is a supply and demand in every bit of the system, and in every bit of the value chain of delivering a function to you, there is, it's, it's more efficient because you only pay for the function, you don't pay for the transaction, transactional cost, and then the function is, 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 is cheaper, it's more affordable, and it's fair. And actually, imagine that you can contribute your cups to the coffee shop and get rewarded when you don't use your cups at home, that is there. You can be contributed to the coffee shop and you get rewarded when other people drink from your cups. I mean, I'm not, it's, it sounds a little futuristic, but I'm just giving you a metaphor. Maybe it will not work with, car, with, with cups, but it will work with flying cars. Because what happens is that if you have a load, or if you have a roof on your house, you can contribute it to the system and get rewarded by other people landing on it. If you have a car, already now there are centralized drive sharing networks where you can contribute your car and get rewarded. But imagine where there are no transaction costs, there are no central costs that it takes a little bit of reward for them. There are less, more efficiency because there are no managers to pay salaries, so everything is based on smart contracts. So what happens is that you don't need to, you basically get compensated for the stuff you are not using when you are contributing them to the network. But that's also how the infrastructure will be built faster. How much effort will it take from one even huge company to build infrastructure in the thousands of cities? It will take a long time. But if, well, like with Bitcoin, if everyone contributes their graphic cards, if everyone contributes their pro 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 processing power, if, if, because they know they will get rewarded, it will just happen much faster and much cheaper and it creates uh, a community effort, it creates entrepreneurship, it creates uh, a lot of rewards, a lot of sort of recurring rewards in the economic system. And uh, all that happens because of the idea of tokenization. And that will be the last idea I will, I will, I will, I will discuss before, before jumping into questions. So because of tokenization, now what does it mean? Um, in the financial industry, it's been known, the concept has been known for decades, and it was called securitization. And securitization literally meant that I could share the ownership of this mobile phone with infinite number of people if I sort of issue a note, and some notes were even exchanged, traded. But if I issue a note saying that I owe you one tenth of a mobile phone, but I don't owe, owe you one tenth of physical phone because if I cut it in pieces, it will lose its value. But I owe you one tenth of its value. So if I sell it, you will take, you will get one tenth. And I, for example, sell ten notes like this, which is a fair thing to do. Um, and then. This, you got a security, you got a, a, a security uh, in terms of financial security, not, not, the, not, uh, not the cyber security type of word, but you, get, you have this paper, this asset, you can record it on, the, on your accounting balance sheet, that you have uh, access or you have exposure to one tenth of a value of a certain asset. And, and, and a number of assets were, were securitized. Uh, gold, uh, shares, exchange, exchange indices, uh, real estate, uh, securitized, and everyone got a little bit of share, a little bit of exposure to the, to the value of that underlying asset. So when 
the Bitcoin came and blockchain came about when when um, uh, tokenization came for the financial industry, it was very easy to absorb the idea that you can actually tokenize instead of securitize, and then you don't need to pay person down their huge fees. You don't have to pay the investment bankers. You don't have to pay the exchange to get your notes listed because it just happens like this by clicking several buttons and writing some code. You can distribute tokens around uh, and by owning the token on the wallet, you have a part of that something. Usually the first projects on blockchain of developing fintech were uh, tokenization of assets. But the thing is, like I told you, you don't need to own the asset anymore, right? To get, because we don't, we don't need those, uh, we don't need gold to own something that will make us rich and be capable of paying money for things we need. Or, or we don't need to own gold to have the function of preserving your huge capital that you earn from selling your startup. You don't need flat to have a function or shelter. Um, so you don't so the next thing is tokenizing the function. So there is a huge now we're coming to Internet of Things. The Internet of Things is ultimately a huge number of uh, bits and pieces of devices interconnected that serve in synchrony to deliver some useful function. That function is needed and that function can be tokenized. And if the value, just consider the concept, if the value of that function is expressed in tokens, and all the value of all bits and pieces that work together, if their value, their sort of contribution is also expressed in those tokens, they get rewarded for their contribution, then you can build huge infrastructures. You can make a lot of global impact by engaging communities into sort of uh, into contributing into uh, uh, around this idea. This has happened in computer games. People have uh, uh, gathered in large communities to, I don't know, to, to, to win the games. Uh, this has happened in Bitcoin, in the real world. We have the system because the community was there and the idea that was central to Bitcoin was freedom of of exchange, freedom of capital, freedom of, uh, of e and ease of capital movement. Now you can tokenize the function, and then you can have around that a, a huge number of people that can contribute in building this. So tokenization is a new way, completely new way, to create stakeholders for projects. Now, who are the stakeholders are either ones who have interest in your projects or those who can influence your projects. So in this respect, your shareholders are stakeholders, your customers, the state, the stakeholder, uh, you have many stakeholders in your project. Your employees definitely. And with each of the stakeholders, you only talk about issues that you think are related to them. So with shareholders, you talk about shareholders corporate governance. With customers you talk about products, with employees you talk within their within their narrow or wide uh, job descriptions. Now owning tokens is another way to make stakeholder interested, heard, and another way of actually uh, engaging full capacity of human intellect and ability into your project. Because he's no longer a state, he's no longer a shareholder, he's also a customer, he's also an investor, because you have heard this term uh, uh, token launches or coin offerings where, where people are crowd, uh, uh, crowd selling tokens, communities are crowd selling tokens to engage, to enlarge the community and raise capital to do it for the cause. So the token holder is the new entity transforming how things are done, how big things are done. Uh, any token holder 
is by definition a point. And the token holder in many cases is a founder. Uh, most of the token holders are usually intellectually contributed. Some, some projects are not even structured in a legal way in terms of like big corporations are structured. Uh, they are just, the people are rewarded because they, they have some tokens, they work uh, in order to make those tokens go up in price. If they go up in price, they get rewarded. Or they own tokens with which they can be accessing that function that will be there for them. And for that function to be there, they are contributing their intellectual powers. And the dialogue you can have with those people is much wider. They, you don't squeeze them into certain roles, which is very important for innovation, because you never know where the idea will come. You never know where they uh, will come from. You, know, you never know where, uh, who, who will be able to contribute how to your project. So you don't, you want to have that engagement as wide as possible. So uh, with this idea, uh, let's just jump into the Q&A. Wow. <laughs> you were the first. So uh, I wanted to ask what you about... What is your So uh, I wanted to, um, to look back to your um, pictures of um, 100 years old, where... Um, um, <clears throat> so uh, it is just... Uh, I wanted to address them. And there we imagined what uh, the uh, encirclement of uh, the person, uh, how, how will it change. But I think that uh, now we should also, uh, uh, with uh, this development of blockchain, and I, I feel like this so sounds like, uh, you know, a groundbreaking technology. And I wanted to ask, what is your vision, in, for example, uh, 20 years, uh, vision of the person, of human, in this blockchain structure and other stuff. It, because I think it is important you know, to listen uh, to opinions uh, on this sort of question. Well, we are, we are elbows deep in developing what, what is called blockchain arrow. That's the community, but also the business consortium. Uh, gathered around the idea of tokenizing the Internet of Things, the infrastructure that will deliver a minute of flight to you. So one of flight token is one minute of flight. And uh, all the infrastructure elements, including the flying cars, will be rewarded by, by operating in that infrastructure um, according to the load of the system. And all the contributors, somebody who has their loads or, or their parking places, or the city that allows the flights to certain numbers, or the dispatch unit that organizes the flights, or somebody who builds a mobile app so that it's convenient to monitor the load and uh, uh, plan your trips. All of these people will have their own entrepreneurial reward within the system, and since there will be no central body who will sort of take a cap or take a margin on all the transactions, it will be the set. so there will be more money available to, for that contribution. And at the same time, the function will cost much less to us. How I see in wired, this is, this is something where our thought process is, is, very, uh, is very intense, and the community, I would actually like to direct some of the questions to Nick uh, that you will be asking, especially related to the community, community building and uh, um, sort of this effort. But we do share the conviction that there will be less and less centralized parties that will centrally coordinate delivery of useful projects or useful products to us. We we'll think that there will be more and more, and there are hundreds of projects on blockchain. You name it, real estate. Uh, okay, you name it, like I said. Uh, Blockchain-based uh, uh, inventory management for, for any kinds of companies. Blockchain-based um, 
networks of coordinating delivery systems and uh, um, blockchain-based uh, social networks where you get rewarded for if you've posted a good stuff compared to if you post the bad stuff. Um, micro transaction, micro lending blockchains where you can easily sort of present yourself, have your credit history available for everyone and people will contribute you their spare money uh, just for you to make the purchase and you will reward them back off your income because it's done automatically. Uh, even blockchains automation for uh, for tax paying your taxes because if you if you have your income like that in the wallet, uh, it's a blockchain, everybody sees your wallet, not you, but your wallet in the wallet blockchain, it's easy to take off taxes off that. This is your income, the taxes go there, everything is automatically, you don't need this huge nice tax office office on Bruce to, to manage the whole stuff. And then there may be less taxes you have to pay, right? So the idea is, I guess the grand idea, is that people will themselves become startupsters in, in a way and, and, and contribute their mental power, their physical assets to building things that they need and get reward. And, uh, and we'll have more things cheaper, we'll need to own less, and we'll have access to more. And one of the grand ideas also about the blockchain era and the flying cars is that imagine the property prices. If the prices of flats are driven by proximity to certain things that you need in life, maybe it's proximity to your work, maybe it's proximity to fat as a libraries, maybe it's proximity to your kindergarten where the kids are going, but it's driven by proximity. And proximity as a function of limit, it's a limitation. Uh, um, it's, it's, a, um, it's driven by proximity, uh, but it's actually driven by the limitation of our ability to travel. Imagine you can go to Istra, uh, to the smartest places, in less than 10 minutes. What will happen to the property price, price in Moscow if you, if you just have that uh, functionality? How much living space will we actually have? Even if we continue together in office, which is another topic we may, we may choose to use virtual reality for that, which is another trend, by the way, which I never spoke. But yeah, uh, consider uh, consider the societal change when people actually understand that they don't need any any manager to, to set tasks for them. They can themselves identify their tasks and contribute and work and get reward and try and fail and then try again and get rewarded and set reservance. It's like freedom of mind also, freedom of uh, uh, goal setting. Is that, does that answer your question? Um, I, I, I've seen that the there. Oh, there, okay. Um, okay. Sorry, but I'm not a uh, data scientist, uh, I'm not an economist, uh, but I have two questions. So the first question is uh, how to prove, uh, to prove uh, common people that uh, this very uh, system blockchain is needed? And the second question is uh, what would happen if uh, suddenly Mm, the energy that maintains this system uh, would come to an end. So, uh, you uh, noticed that uh, this system uh, uh, consumes a uh, lot of energy. Right. So, um, uh, how to prove that blockchain is really needed by people? Is that, is that the first For one? everybody. For everybody? Yes. Well, I think that well, Elon Musk has once said, uh, invention of the internet is uh, compared to uh, an organism developing a neural, neural network. So there were, or, there were multicellular or, or organisms before. They were community cells were communicating by sending small chemical agents between the cells. And then the neural network appeared, and that allowed a more complex behavior of those multicellular organisms which you and me are. Um, invention of HTTP protocol enabled the internet trigger. It's the protocol. Now, how can you validate that HTTP protocol is needed by everyone? Well, 
My mother doesn't need HTTP protocol so much because she really needs, she really needs WhatsApp and, uh, and Viber and those don't use HTTP protocol. But blockchain, if you ask me, is yet another protocol. It's not a product in itself. It's not a disruptive technology, if you want the terms. Um, it's, um, and that was the term, the, it's, it's a evolutionizing technology, it's supporting technology. It's, uh, it, it's, it changes ways of things are done in so many industries, but it doesn't eliminate any processes or any industries compared to maybe some other technologies. So how do I validate? Well, you can already validate by so many people using it already, and so many uses of it, and so many supporters of it, and so many so much enthusiasm about that being the uh, the new way we should do things. Now, what happens if electricity uh, goes down? Well, that's of course a theoretical scenario uh, that may happen, uh, but there are other proof of. Uh, on other consensus mechanisms there, uh, not only proof of uh, proof of work. So uh, I don't think that the next that in the blockchain we will be growing the energy consumption. Most of the contemporary blockchains are not using the computing power to have a stake in the system. They are using uh, uh, they are using the if you like the financial power, the more tokens you have, the more influence you have in the system, the more sort of you support the system, you sign those uh, uh, blocks. So um, that requires much less energy. But what happens if, generally speaking, what happens in Moscow if electricity suddenly breaks for two days? I don't know. I think those crisis scenarios are of course, uh, elaborated by the ministry, there is a ministry for it, but uh, I assume it won't be a pleasant uh, time about electricity, if that's the question. So I want to know uh, whether uh, could be this system uh, immortal? Abandoned in everything? Immortal in terms of surviving us, uh, it can be, yes. I think it's, it's physical, so if we suddenly uh, all die from, from some strange disease, the computers will work for, for some time and uh, they continue to maintain the system. That, that is a possible scenario. Anyway. All right. Uh, so my name is Arab again. Uh, you mentioned the ministry, actually, that's uh, the point of my speaking. As I heard you, as I get you, yeah, the thing uh, that Bitcoin offers us is a super democracy. Uh, there is a project for it. There is an app for it, like, like Steve Jobs used to say, and the app is called Tezos. It's, uh, this, is, uh, this is a special blockchain for voting. Decentralized voting. Yes, there is an app for it. So okay. uh, that means uh, the thing that you mentioned, the more you earn uh, the tokens, uh, the more you contribute, uh, the more you get. So, uh, uh, I hope I'm not ruining the party, but uh, the question was, what about controlling it? I mean, uh, how do you control if the person whose wallet we know, but we don't know who, who he is, what he buys, what if it's illegal, and uh, what about that? That's maybe the jurisdiction question, but I think it's important. Well, that's uh, that's a very good question. I think I think there are actually several questions. But when you ask how do we control the learn, I would first uh, always ask why do you think we need to control? Uh, but uh, consider cash. If you go out and buy something with, I mean, we had no problems with cash for thousands of years, right? Uh, you go out and buy something with cash. Who controlled you on that? No, I, I go buy cash, so my personal body goes and buys, for example, drugs, and I can be caught on that. Certainly, but then, but then your personal body will go there and collect, uh, collect whatever you bought with bitcoins anyway. I mean, it's just, it's, just, it's just part of the transaction. Another part is the delivery, another part is your using it, another part is the uh, consequences of you using it. So all these other parts uh, have effect on the world. What you are saying is that 
uh, what if you do a damaging thing to the world? Or what happens if you do the damaging thing to the other members of society and there are other ways to control that beyond limiting your ability to pay for stuff you we don't want you to have, right? That's it. Uh, we got a methods of control to about the cash. I mean, we have the government. But what about the bitcoins? Are there any methods of control? Well, again, uh, maybe it's even better because Cash transactions are not recorded. Bitcoin transactions are actually recorded. And there have been cases of seizing and uh, arresting uh, illegal markets that were operating on purely Bitcoins. You would be surprised, but maybe it's actually easier for governments to and for, for law enforcement people to actually uh, uh, trace uh, everything that you've done once you're identified. While with cash, you don't trace exchange of cash at all. So uh, even if you're caught with the last transaction, you can't be traced back. With Bitcoin, in some cases you can. So uh, they can trace you back and actually see everything you've done. And, uh, and that's actually a, what you're saying is a threat I would say it's also an opportunity there. But again, what, what you want to limit is not people transacting. I mean, transacting money is a lame, a lousy way. Uh, limiting your ability to transact money is a lousy way uh, to limit your ability to, 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 to conduct crime. Crime is not when you exchange monies. Crime is when you take that gun that you've bought and go shooting people. That's not a thing. You have to... This is, this is the lousiness, the, the lameness of the law enforcement sometimes. They try to limit you somewhere else. But, in, but, but what they need to be doing is limit you exactly uh, when you're trying to commit a crime. And transacting, just transacting monies is not a crime. Crime is to own certain things in some countries. Crime is to use certain things in some countries. Crime is to sort of affect other people. So go in there. Thanks, I hope I get uh, one more little question. Uh, it might be specific. Uh, I just Googled it that the uh, Bitcoin account can be blocked only, only oh, the only person that can block your account is you. Mm, well, uh, there are a number of people who have blocked their accounts by losing their passwords. So, uh, fate, destiny or fatum can block your account. But okay, a coincidence can block your account. Memory loss can block your account. But that's right, uh, you can't block accounts. There's no, there's no body, there's no program that can block your account. Well, if you have a wallet full of $100 notes, is there anybody who can block your wallet? No, no somebody can steal it. Well, that's also happened on blockchain. Uh, it is possible to steal your wallet. So why not? Uh, Physically, from you. If you have your wallet on your mobile phone, yeah, somebody yeah. can take your mobile phone, they have taken your wallet. All right, thanks. But the, the good news is that if you remember your private key, you may be the first one to run to the computer network and reactivate your wallet on another device and change your private key and then you have no access to your money. So it's actually better than wallet because you still, you still have some chance. Okay, can uh, continue the, the topic about uh, limited. Uh, who limits the uh, money in blockchain? I mean, government print money for us and can control it and other. And in blockchain, who can uh, control the whole money in this system? And if it's government, so how they, I don't know, should we do convers uh, they do conversation between each other? That's a good question. Uh, the idea with particular Bitcoin blockchain is that nobody controls it. 
it's the mathematical algorithm and the ever-rising complexity of the mathematical task that needs to be solved to mine more money controls the money. At the same time, what you really you don't actually you don't you shouldn't care about how many bitcoins are there. But what you should care because they are almost infinitely divisible. I mean we can we can trade in fractions of bitcoins. So it's it's not a problem. The, the, the problem is to match the value of cash you have in circulation in the economy, the value of money that you have in circulation, to match that with the value of valuable stuff to buy with that money. Now, if the amount of valuable stuff goes down, like production is destroyed like in the 90s in the Soviet Union, but the money is still there. You have a lot of money, little stuff to buy, the money becomes worthless. You may have another scenario where you have a lot of valuable stuff in the economic system to buy with fixed amount of money, and then you have a different, I and mean, the money suddenly rises in, in price because it has to match the buying power, and there is more stuff to buy. That's what destroyed the golden standard, where we, are, we all remember that, that once upon a time, all the currencies were backed with the, gold, with the holdings of gold. The problem was that the world, the world managed to develop valuable stuff at a much higher pace that the world was able to dig gold off the ground so that things didn't match. So there was less and less gold available to buy the value of this stuff, and then suddenly we decided, okay, let's cut the gold, I mean, let's just send out paper. So, uh, issue paper. And they, those economists in the Federal Reserve System, they are you and the International Monetary Fund, they're not just printing money because they want. What they want is they want to have Precisely, the, the speed of circulation of money times the volume of money gives you the total sort of money available in the system. And that has to match roughly the pace at which the valuable stuff in the system uh, grows or, or falls uh, in, in, in availability. And to manage this, is required that centralized system with all the economists and guys like myself who have their degree in economics. Um, we are made to do that and only that. That's what that's what we're economics. But in blockchain, you don't need that. You don't need that function. That function is important. Because, because what you have is you have those valuable stuffs and you have those bitcoins and they are there. Bitcoins are rising in value because there are more and more stuff you can buy with Bitcoin. You have, we have experience like double, double, uh, rise, double, uh, uh, doubling the price of Bitcoins in the last, um, I think, quarter. Because of the publicity, because there are more and more stuff you can buy with Bitcoins. And, but the thing is that for you and me, it actually doesn't matter. Because what matters is that we can always have a fraction of Bitcoin to buy more and more stuff there. There will be more and more. So it only matters for those who have mined Bitcoins a long time ago, now they are multi-millionaires. But, okay, so be it. Uh, some people suddenly became rich. They could have found the treasure uh, that a pi pirate has left somewhere. We, we don't have to measure this, take this into account. From the economic system, what makes sense is that you have those tokens in circulation, and nobody prints them, and you have more and more stuff available, and it does not impose any inflation or deflation effect on the, on the currency. It, I mean, for us, or for the users, it, it does ultimately, because of the... We can, we can, but, but with another... But that's, that's exactly what I want... I, I'm sorry I'm taking this too long, but in a system where you have tokenized function, you will not have even that. Because Bitcoin is an intermediary. We still consider that these coins on blockchain have to be this universal payment tool, which Bitcoin is. That is just money. But imagine a world where we do not need money at all. 
Because money is essentially a centralized function helping us to understand the value of different things in the system. We cannot understand how many potatoes do I have to exchange for those eggs and how many of those together I need to exchange for one minute of flight. Because it's, it's complicated, there are so many things with different pounds. But, and that money is just a term of expression, and it's easy to transact in money, it's easy to keep the money, you can save money, you can... A lot of things around money. Not needed anymore. Not just not needed. Because you can express the flight in, or a function in a token, like in one flight token, we express one minute of flight, technically. And that, that's, the, that's the value on its own. And then you can have, you can exchange, you may, maybe that will be the central value. What will be the central value if you don't need money? Will it be the kilowatt of energy? Maybe we will express other things in energy units. Or maybe we will express everything else in flight units, because flight is freedom, it's more fundamental than just energy. Maybe we will express, maybe there will be some blockchain for creativity, Creativity may be, may be tokenized. Maybe we'll express value of coffee in Starbucks in creativity units because we don't need rubles or dollars for that. Uh, yeah, that's that's the idea behind that. So uh, well, that's a big question. Let's try to say something here. Yeah. Really, yeah, thanks much. We see that you are very excited about blockchain, and we know that you are a bigger expert than we are. So please help us with one question that should like steer the discussion the other way. So. We know for a fact that people exist in the world who don't like blockchain. For example, there is an official press release of Kaspersky that came out one month ago. There is also a press release of Apple, where people with a lot of experience explain point by point why blockchain is bad. Again, you know these people better than we do. So, let us ask you to play the game. Imagine that you are given something very valuable, to explain now very quickly why blockchain is bad, what kind of argument would you bring based on all this argument that we observe in the market? Thank you. Uh, that's a very good question, but please don't know the, which particular blockchain. I think there are about 10 or 20 different blockchains out there. Bitcoin and Ethereum. Bitcoin and Ethereum. Bitcoin and Ethereum. Yes. Okay, very well. Uh, so, uh, Bitcoin blockchain and Ethereum blockchain, they both have inefficiencies in their technology. They have their limits. Uh, and uh, the limits, uh, well, just, just, just a little disclaimer. Those limits are very well recognized. You don't need Kaspersky to outline those limits. Those who, guys who made Bitcoin, they know they're more ethereal, they know their limits, and actually they talk about those limits uh, every day. And uh, everything is new YouTube, I mean, it's community effort. So, um, uh, the uh, limit of blockchain that has been recognized, and that's why you may have heard it all this before, has been that now we have Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Core. The limit was recognized that people are using Bitcoins for so many things for which. Uh, the designers of Bitcoin didn't think they would be using those Bitcoins and Bitcoin blockchain. They're using blockchain, the technology, for so many other things than just transacting coins that the technology is not able to scale fast enough to serve that ever-increasing need. That's why Bitcoin Cash appeared for those who need faster transactions, those who need more data in, embedded into any transaction, and that will be developments more and more. So Ethereum, the core and fundamental uh, problem uh, with Ethereum, as far as I understand it, is that when people increase uh, uh, intensity of using Ethereum blockchain, it's not so much that it stalls like Bitcoin blockchain, but it grows in size. So, for example, if you have a real hardcore blockchain wallet, you download all the blockchain to your computer and it's suddenly 160 gigabytes of data. This is the blockchain. So for Ethereum, and, and, but then it grows linearly. But for Ethereum, the more people use it, the more code is there, the more 
the virtual machine uh, spread around the holders of Ethereum processes that code, the amount of data grows exponentially. And that is exactly the problem that um, actually now, I think in September, it's either already happened or is about to happen. There will be an update to Ethereum blockchain, so that particular problem will be tackled. But there will be many other problems later on. And if you ask me, I don't think, uh, I think that Ethereum blockchain and Bitcoin blockchain are just two blockchains that are candidates to survive in the future. They may not survive. But blockchain as a concept, that's why I centered around the usability of the technology, different applications and changes it may bring to how we sort of transact with interactive technology and with our, our, our own peers, is because the concept is still there. There will be different ways, like computing power grows all the time, the, the limits are recognized all the time, the new applications put more stresses on the technology than developers of that, so it's a constant process. But thank you for the question. Yes, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's important to, to understand that, because somebody was asking, oh, I want, like, how could we avoid making mistakes? So one could say, okay, Vitalik Buterin made a mistake coding Ethereum like that. Okay, it was maybe uh, not so much a mistake, but he coded it in certain circumstances, and the environment changes so fast, that in the new circumstances, it has to be changed. It's not a mistake. So if you reframe mistakes to actually decisions you make, you make decisions with a full sort of availability of information and your computational power in your head and, and, and distributed computational power in the heads of your peers and communities and, and stakeholders and project team members, you make decisions. These are, these are not mistakes. If future shows it doesn't work, you just make new decisions. <laughs> I guess that's 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 the way it is. Don. There it is. Um, that flies when you're having fun. Um, I think I would propose that we finish the lecture part um, and um, switch it into uh, like one-to-one -one conversations. Of course, there is no such thing as one-to-one -one conversation when there is only one lecture and uh, 250 of you. Uh, but we need to move ahead. Um, so let's thank the speaker.